why glazing matters so much more than insulation. I'd like to start us off this week with a little quiz. I've presented the same example a few times, so you might already be familiar with it, but to me, it never gets old. It challenges some of our most powerful assumptions about energy and thermal performance and provides great perspective for conversations about glass in architecture. And with that, here we go. Take a hypothetical wall. Suppose 50% is glazed and 50% is opaque. And suppose the wall portion is R20 and suppose the window portion is R2. For the purposes of this little thought experiment, don't think of this as a real wall with studs and thermal bridging and construction defects and stuff. Just think of some kind of monolithic R20 material perfectly joined to some kind of monolithic R2 material. What will the average R value of the facade be? Will it be A, about R11, B, about R4, or C, about R18? We're gonna go through this together, but here's some think time if you really wanna guess. Think, think, think. Okay, the equation we use to calculate the average R value of the facade is this. It's not a straight calculation of average, and the reason is outside the scope of this discussion. But if you're interested in looking it up, Allison Bales has a great article on greenbuildingadvisor.com explaining the reason. So you could just Google his name and Green Building Advisor and series and parallel flow and you'll find it. Also, Allison Bales is a terrific explainer of scientific things. It's definitely worth keeping an eye out for anything he writes or presents. Anyway, if we use this equation on our hypothetical wall, we end up with an overall R value of 3.6. So the answer is B, about four. And that's crazy, right? By making half of the facade glass, our overall thermal performance is 80% less than the performance of the opaque wall alone. Now, I know I said this wasn't a real wall, but I picked these numbers on purpose. A standard residential two by six wood wall has R21 cavity insulation, and R2 is the same as U0.5, which is pretty average for residential glass. It's also about what we see in even thermally broken commercial aluminum windows and curtain walls. Let's take this thought experiment further though. Suppose we were to double the performance of the wall to R40. And before we look at what effect that has on overall thermal performance, let's talk about what it takes to get a standard residential wall from about R20 to R40. We have to add exterior insulation and not a small amount of exterior insulation. We have to add R20. So we're looking at around four inches or more of exterior insulation. That has some pretty significant cost and design implications, but would it also have a significant effect on overall thermal performance? Let's see. It would bring our average R value from 3.6 to 3.8. That's a lot of work for barely a rounding error of added performance. But let's return to our baseline R20 wall, and instead of doubling the thermal performance of the wall, let's double the R value of the windows from R2 to R4. This gets us an average R value of 6.6. .6. By improving the glass, we've nearly doubled the overall performance of the facade, but we're still 67% less than the performance of the opaque wall alone. R4, by the way, is very good residential glass. This is obviously always changing, but for reference, the best glazing systems top out around R9 or so. Let's now keep our R4 windows and reduce the amount of glazing to 30%. So instead of a 50-50 split, we've got a 70-30 split between our opaque wall and glazing. This gets us to R9 overall. So now we're really starting to get somewhere. We're two and a half times better than where we started, but we still haven't even reached half the performance of a two by six cavity insulated opaque wall. What this means is that glass matters a lot. 
I think when some people see this, they think that the proper response is to, is to hate glass. <laughs> that is not what I'm intending. What this is really saying, to me anyway, is that glass is an investment. And when we make that investment, we ought to make it really count. Let's now take this concept and see what its effect is on the effective thermal resistance of residential wall assemblies based on an 18% glazing ratio. I'm gonna show you a chart and we're gonna go through it together. The chart plots the overall effective R value for the wall, including the windows. That's on the vertical axis. And the overall performance of the walls is based on how good the windows are which is on the horizontal axis. The chart is showing three different walls. All of them are 82% opaque and 18% glass. The top red line is an R30 opaque wall. The hot pink line is an R20 wall. And the light pink line is an R10 wall. What you'll notice is that at the right side of the graph where the windows aren't very good, there's very little difference in the overall performance of the three walls. So if you have crappy windows, whatever you do with the rest of the wall doesn't matter all that much. But as you move left and improve the glass, you'll notice that the difference in the walls becomes more pronounced. An R30 wall performs much better than an R10 wall when the glass is better. And the relationship isn't linear, it's exponential. So again, another reason to invest in your windows. But there's one last part of all this that will really help us, and that is to understand glazing ratios a bit better. The chart I just showed held the glazing ratio constant at 18%. A lot of times people hear that and think that 18% seems like not a lot of glass at all, like 18% glass on a home would be dark and unpleasant. And that's certainly my own intuition. Um, I am happy to tell you though, that our intuition is typically really wrong on this. As an exercise, I, I recommend guessing what the glazing ratio is in your own house, and then taking a tape measure and calculating it out and seeing how the two numbers compare. Most people greatly overestimate the glazing ratio of their favorite spaces. This is often because their favorite spaces are actually really pretty well designed. My own house is just under 16% glazed, and it feels pretty bright and comfortable to me. This house in San Diego has a large 20-foot sliding door, and it's only 24% glazed. We start to have real trouble providing high-performance buildings once we exceed about 40% glass. After that, it's difficult to get glass that's good enough and walls that are good enough to be considered even remotely energy efficient overall. To put all of this in the larger context of energy efficient design, the top three enclosure related factors that influence how energy efficient a building will be are one, glazing ratio, what percentage of the building is glass and how good is that glass, two, air tightness, how well have we separated the inside from the outside? And three, insulation. How much insulation are we using and is it continuous? Now obviously both air tightness and insulation are really, really important. And all of the effort that we put into designing these into our buildings is of course well worth it. But investing in careful design and good glass is even more important. And it makes our other efforts at air sealing and insulating even more successful.